Well, hi, everybody. I'm Melissa Sussman, Lead Technical Advocate at Sumo Logic. Um, I'm here to talk to you about AI-driven alerting. So basically, our goal with anomaly detection and the AI-driven alerting is to reduce alert noise by 60 to 90%. We want to minimize false positives and prevent false negatives. So basically, once an anomaly is detected, our alert response feature provides a summary and links to automated playbooks for diagnosis and remediation, which basically is going to help reduce um, your incident resolution time. So this is what we've got on the agenda for today. Basically, we're going to go through the AI ops lifecycle, some challenges with classic alerting techniques, and then our next gen ML based anomaly detection. And then we're going to get into how that actually works. And then we're going to do the demo. So this slide is really just demonstrating the sort of life cycle that you have with um, our AI ops features. So this basically involves identifying all the, the discovery stage, I guess, is the, is the start, um, where you see like the app, the service, the infrastructure entities, and that little image is supposed to kind of depict our service map a little bit. <laughs> so you'd have uh, our tracing service map. That step basically involves identifying all the application services and infrastructure entities within your environment. So for example, when you're using our tracing technology, we can create all of these service maps and then gather telemetry data. Um, and then when you're looking at the telemetry data, you're basically looking at the various data types, including metrics, events, logs, and traces. So that's where the melt telemetry comes from. That data basically forms the foundation for detecting anomalies and generating you know, alerts. So um, the next step is anomaly detection. So traditional alerting systems um, often use just like static thresholds. So those are just predefined limits, such as you know, if latency exceeds, let's say five seconds, that would be just a static threshold. But these static thresholds can be problematic because they may not adapt well to the variability in, in your systems, leading to sort of false positives or even false negatives. So um, the system might not understand what thresholds are should be expected um, versus not. So our AI-driven alerting approach um, basically uses dynamic thresholds, which adjust based on your real-time data patterns. So the idea is that this would reduce false positives and then ensure more relevant alerts, hopefully. Um, the next step is alert response. So once an anomaly is detected, our system generates a detailed alert response. So that basically summarizes the alert and provides curated analytics to help you understand the context and the root cause analysis. Um, the next step here is basically automation playbooks. The automation playbooks basically speed up the incident resolution time that you can uh, you can have with any incident, I guess. We basically um, use predefined workflows that diagnose and remediate those issues automatically, which reduces the time that it takes to resolve any sort of incident. So, um, and then of course, prevention. So that, the, the really the last step in this case with this playbook that we're going to do today is going to be more um, around preventing continuous attacks. In this case, we're going to be looking at an exfiltration attack, um, but it can look like different things depending on what the what really the root cause of that incident may be. So yeah. So this slide kind of depicts the difference between AI-driven alerting and older methods. So this is kind of looking at the older method. So here we want to talk about traditional static thresholds, as mentioned previously. So in the past, many of our customers relied on static, static thresholds for monitoring. So those thresholds are set based on expected normal values. Like if alerting CPU usage, for instance, exceeds 80%, that should, that, you know, is basically what would have been used um, in case you have, you know, let's say a static threshold, but they can have a lot of drawbacks. So one is that you can actually experience what's known as false positives, where the threshold is set too low, and then the normal fluctuations can trigger alerts unnecessarily, leading to alert fatigue. And then the other situation that you might have are false negatives. So the threshold could be set too high, and then critical issues could be missed. 
that are basically causing potential downtime or potential confusion um, for, you know, in this case, it would be your uh, SRE or your SOC team or your uh, security analysts. So if your application's typical latency, for instance, is like two seconds, setting a threshold at one second would result in constant alerts. Then you would experience alert fatigue. While setting it at five seconds, you might actually miss like critical performance issues. And then the static thresholds are not actually, you know, they're not actually alerting when they should. So the static thresholds are not adaptable to changes in your application's behavior. In contrast, our AI-driven anomaly detection adapts to your data's normal behavior. So it would detect um, deviations that actually matter. So getting into it, um, you really are, the goal is that it would reduce the alert noise and focuses on anomalies that actually require your, att your attention. We do that by using advanced algorithms to sort of detect those anomalies. So in this case, we're kind of seeing the classic alert next to sort of the next gen anomaly detection. It's taking into consideration a few things. One is the algorithm is first detecting seasonal patterns in the data, and that sort of helps distinguish between the regular fluctuations and genuine anomalies. And then we have also a cluster-based anomaly detection, which is a technique that's basically involves examining data points within a specified window and then identifying groups of anomalies based on their behavior. So for instance, if a certain number of data points deviate significantly from the norm within a specific period, they might be flagged as an anomaly. There's also sensitivity settings. Um, so that can also change depending on how users adjust the sensitivity settings. It's basically like if you're familiar with the AI terms, it would be like the discriminator. So like if you're working with like in a separate sort of similar uh, space, um, if you're working with anything GPT, you have a discriminator that basically allows you to, to set you know, how much it can make up versus not. Well, the sensitivity settings would basically um, allow you to fine tune the, detec the detection process. So a higher sensitivity basically means lighter thresholds leading to more alerts, while the lower sensitivity allows for more flexibility, which reduces the number of false alerts. So the primary goal again is to reduce that alert noise. The static thresholds often result in too many positive alerts or false negatives. So you can miss things that you're not really supposed to miss, but you can also end up with so many alerts that you are experiencing, your team experiences alert fatigue. So by dynamically basically adjusting those thresholds and using sophisticated detection algorithms, we can significantly reduce these false alerts. Um, so once an anomaly is detected, basically our system then generates an alert. Oh, let's go back. So, once an anomaly is detected, our system generates an alert. That alert response page basically provides a summary and then links to the automated playbooks. And we're gonna get into that in just a minute. Um, but for now, we're gonna get into, I guess, a little bit more about how that works. So first we do data collection. We collect extensive telemetry data. So that includes the, the melt data, if you will, logs, metrics, traces, events. And then that data forms the basis for detecting your anomalies. Then you do baseline establishment. So the system uses historical data to establish a baseline of what's normal behavior and what that really looks like within your application and services. That involves analyzing patterns and identifying regular fluctuations and trends. So um, then you have, again, those dynamic thresholds. So unlike those static thresholds, which are fixed and not flexible, the anomaly detection employs dynamic thresholds. So those basically adjust in real time based on the ongoing analysis of the data. And that's how it works. So here we're getting into the um, AI-driven alerting demo that we're gonna do. So first, this is essentially what, we're, what happens within the demo, but we, because we've made the demo, we know this now, but um, this is gonna go into an investigation around an exfiltration. So the first thing is the attacker gains access to a production EC2 instance after finding credentials in a GitHub repository. Next, they get access to the production database, which is established from this EC2 instance. 
Then a da database snapshot is taken using these credentials and is shared with an external AWS account, triggering a classic alert from, an a from AWS guard duty. With persistent access, the attacker then begins exfiltration over um, that data um, after the, creating new security groups. And then we get an alert. And that basically detects anomalous network activity that's designed to alert security engineers of suspicious activity tied to servers with that access. Then we do an automation playbook. So that's basically um, associated with the alert type that's executed to respond to the incident. This is also triggering a, a Slack alert, which we'll get into. Then the automation service um, runs the playbook, checking the reputation of the IP address and determines if it's malicious. The attacker's network access is revoked in AWS by the playbook through automated actions. And then the SOC is notified via a JIRA ticket. Um, and the Slack alert is designed to basically let folks know about the suspicious activity that occurred. This is the portion of today's demo that I'm going to focus on. So I'll get into it. Um, Basically, you would start with <laughs> opening the alert response page, which I already did before this, just to make sure that we had everything already running and working. Um, basically, this is what you would see in the case of an AI-driven alert. You see a spike in essentially like data exfiltration right here. We were talking about seasonality previously. We noticed that there is some amount of exfiltration that should be expected but not all of it is basically, not all of it is necessarily quite at the threshold of this alert. Um, if I were the, um, I guess someone like a security analyst or someone on the SOC team, and I were investigating this right now, I might not necessarily assume that something had gone horribly wrong just from the get-go, but I might then decide to check the AWS network firewall dashboard. And we'll pull this up. So interestingly enough, when I go to look at the top data transfer connections and I look at the size of the data against all of these different IP addresses, I'm noticing that this is a large size, you know, that is like several, you know, standard deviations above what is expected. And it is coming from this IP address. This is also the same IP address that is in sort of these alerts. So you can pretty much at that point assume, OK, so there's something fishy that's going on with this particular IP address. And interestingly enough, it's from a location that you're not necessarily expecting as a SOC analyst in this particular example. So um, you can kind of see from the geolocation that it's not somewhere that you know you have standard operations just normally happening in. So you can also within the tool show what's going on, you know, if there is some seasonality that you're expecting, um, you know, further back, you can see, okay, well, some amount of exfiltration is maybe expected, but not quite this much. Then we can kind of, let's dive into the playbook and actually break down what can occur. So this is where we can actually look into what, what is going on in the playbook as a whole. Um, I can just get into some of this a little bit. So let me just scroll in. So glad I got a mouse for this demo because <laughs> I cannot do this on a trackpad. So you basically are, um, this is where we're just getting the IP address. We're looking at that suspicious IP. And there's a few different, I guess, work streams happening here. The one that, uh, that kind of helps with um, some of the data enrichment is this middle one. You kind of get an idea of what is the IP reputation? What is actually happening with that IP address? Um, then there's sort of an if condition that, that is set to see if it's actually suspicious. Um, then it basically creates a notification 
via JIRA. So it creates essentially a ticket so that your SOC team can come in and actually take a look. Um, and you can see suspicious activity has been detected from a malicious IP. And then it basically gets the IP address. The next notification that you get is the same one that we actually saw earlier in Slack. It's the Slack notification that just lets you know, hey, there's a spike in cloud data transfer. That's suspicious, right? So <laughs> then you basically, it, it gets that same IP address um, and just informs your team. The, the good thing about that is um, basically it enables some business process automation so that your team can stay in lockstep and so that people can know across you know, your, your SOC team what is going on at any given time. This kind of helps with reducing, like I said before, you know, reducing that mean time to recovery. Over here, we have a sort of different step. This is actually the revoke, um, this is the revoke security group inbound rule that um, essentially takes that IP address and then does some amount of, um, I guess, security group <laughs> revoking. So let me go back to this slide over here. So basically, um, the attacker has a new security group. It's essentially saying, let's not let that security group continue to access things within this AWS environment. Um, and then down here, we're actually looking at blocking the source IP itself. This is more of just a, a containment step against the IP address. And then you actually create a new rule group. And it's basically saying in this case, we don't really, we don't, we we don't really want to have um, unknown, let's say unknown rule groups really accessing um, our AWS environment. So then you add a rule group to your firewall po policy, and then you describe the firewall policy. And this is sort of the last containment step that you really are trying to do here. Um, the advantage of all of this is since this is all automated, your team is then better able to, um, to actually work in lockstep. Folks are better able to um, actually resolve their issues much more quickly. Um, and at the end of the day, hopefully this <laughs> means that you get uh, more sleep through the night or you don't necessarily have to you know, come and deal with this uh, with every little step. Um, and you can just kind of check and see, double check that the playbook ran as expected. You can just do your investigation to see whether or not things really were functioning as expected. Um, and then that's kind of the end of that playbook.